Okay, uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Texas a and Institute of Neuroscience uh, uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Yalong P, and today I'm going to talk about uh, computer vision with PyTorch and uh, its applications. So uh, we, uh, I see uh, we, we, we probably are from different backgrounds. So first I will go over the digital camera and the principles. So everyone's on the same page. And then I will talk about uh, deep neural network. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna move on to convolutional neural network, which is a uh, network uh, type designed specifically for computer vision. And then I will introduce some advanced uh, CNN uh, models for object detection, pixel segmentation, and video understanding. And uh, lastly, we are going to have a hands-on experiment. This experiment will be about uh, dog breed classification. So uh, it will be in Google Colab, and uh, we will be using PyTorch. This is the content of this uh, presentation. Uh, so first, uh, I want to go over uh, digital cameras. Uh, this picture here is showing the pinhole principle for most of the cameras. We have the 3D object outside, and then we need a black box. We don't let any light come in. And we put a hole on the box, so uh, we will see a upside down image on the wall of the box. This phenomenon was uh, discovered in uh, ancient uh, Persia, or it's nowadays it's called uh, Iran, uh, as a trick, and uh, a lot of people know it. But it's not until recently uh, people started putting uh, chemical films, and the chemicals that will interact with the different intensity of light, so we can actually uh, get a picture by using this uh, pinhole principle. Uh, and of course, nowadays we use uh, digital sensors to measure the light uh, intensity. We have uh, CCD and the CMOS, different types of sensors. Uh, so each sensor here, uh, it represents a pixel. So when you buy a camera, it says a thousand by a thousand, that's a uh, thousand by a thousand pixels or sensors, that's a lot. So roughly how it works is that uh, it's shown here. So for each pixel, uh, we have red, green, and blue. It's called RGB channels. And we have, uh, for, for each channel, we have the sensor structured like this. So we have some material on top uh, facing the light coming in. And uh, this material only, we only let, for example, red light to go through. And then we measure the intensity of this and we transform that into uh, digital signals. The same for green and blue. And then uh, we send the signals to, uh, to the users. So uh, on the display side, uh, on monitors or phones or your uh, uh, VR glasses, uh, we reconstruct uh, the image using those three channels. So uh, the, the reason for those three channels is that uh, based on those uh, different combinations of red, green, and blue channels, we can see uh, many more different colors, like the purple, black, and white, and uh, et cetera. But uh, I want to mention that we are not seeing the actual light. We are seeing the combination of those three element uh, lights. This is uh, one, uh, one uh, principle of the RGB images. The other one is here in this uh, equation. We, on the right side, we have the X and the Y and the Z coordinates of this candle. But after the uh, camera processing, we are going to construct an image which only had X and Y. So in this process, we will lose one dimension, which is Z. And uh, this key R T, those are the parameters about the camera, the focal length and et cetera. So I, I want to briefly introduce how cameras work. And uh, when we talk about images, digital images, uh, this is an example. This is an 8-bit Abraham Lincoln with a, the resolution of 12 by 16 pixels. So there are 12 pixels uh, horizontally, and uh, there are 16 pixels uh, vertically. And uh, for each pixel, or we 
introduced earlier. Uh, when there is no light, we give the value of zero. And when it is the most intense, we give the value of 255, which is based on 8 bit. So altogether, uh, when we display it, we display the intensity based on the uh, based on the numbers, and then we see the picture. So when you say you send your friend your uh, a selfie, you are actually sending a matrix of all those uh, numbers in binary to the internet, and your friend gets the image from the internet and then reconstruct on their phone. So when we talk about uh, processing the images, we're mainly talking about processing uh, this kind of matrices. Of course, uh, this is the black and white. We have RGB images as well, I guess with more uh, channels. Okay, uh, that's the foundation about uh, uh, digital images. And then we are going to talk about new network or deep new network. So, uh, New network is inspired by human brains uh, because of the connection between uh, our brain neurons is very similar to the connection we are seeing here. So a new network, an N, will take X as input and output Y. So X here, though those are all numbers. This can be a, a very a list of a very um, a list of uh, a very long list of numbers and then in the output. We have also numbers as a uh, output. And in between each circle here represents a neuron. This is a placeholder. So inside of this neuron, we will have a variable, for example, I1 here. And in each connection, we have weights and the bias. So weight, uh, WM here represents weight, B is the bias. So how it works is that we have input numbers. And for each connection, we use this. For each connection, if we want to calculate this i, we, we, we use x1 times w1 and plus b1 for this connection. And uh, we do the same for all the previous connections. So, uh, and then we sum it up and we use activation function. Here, this activation function is to press the, the output of this summation between one and zero. So we don't have ridiculously uh, big numbers. And we do the same for each neuron here and then pass it down to the next layer. So uh, this is for the one layer. And uh, if we have one more lined up neuron, there's another layer. When you have many neurons, like uh, 50 or 100 new, uh, layers, it's called a deep neural network. So a typical deep neural network, we have millions of weights and biases. And uh, if we want to get the right output Y, we need to optimize, get somehow get the right biases and the weights. And the process to get those, uh, to optimize those weights is called uh, back propagation or it's called model training. So here I'm going to show how this is done in principle in the simplest example. So we get the idea of how, how we uh, train the model. So um, we have two input, x1 and x2. We have two neurons, i1 and i2, and we have only one out of y. Uh, of course, we, without any information, we uh, don't know what's going on, but we can randomize the weights, w1 to w6 first. And then we can make some wild prediction. Why predict? We can use uh, this x1 times x1 times w2 plus uh, x2 times w3, and we get i1, and then times w5, and the same for w6. So we can make a wild prediction. And this predict prediction is going to be wrong, of course. And uh, uh, we can calculate the error by using this equation. This equation can be, it is called a loss function, error metric, uh, error metric. And uh, you can change it, you can write it yourself. But uh, here is for simplicity, we use this equation. We can use the y predicted y minus the true y. So how we get the true y? The true y is from the training set that we collect. Uh, ideally, we should have the training data set prepared already. Uh, training data set means that we, we know the 
input x, and we know the output y, and we pair them together. And uh, we should have hundreds of, uh, or thousands of uh, training data points already, so we can optimize the weights in between. Okay, now how do we optimize the uh, weights? So here we are only talking about the weights. Uh, of course, we will do the same thing for bias. For simplicity, we are not looking at bias now. And uh, let's take a, a look at this equation, which we, we will use to get all the optimized or correct weights. So here, Wm prime, this is the target weight. And uh, we don't know, we want to get this right. And this WN here is the randomly initialized weight. And then we use this random initialized number minus a learning rate. Learning rate is just a very small number times the partial uh, derivative of this, w, uh, of this WN. And then we make a small chain. So for example, if we take W6 here, uh, and if, uh, if we want to get the W6 prime, we use the O, the previous W6, minus learning rate times the partial difference, uh, partial derivative of W6 in, uh, in, uh, with the arrow function. And we do have the arrow function here. So it's convenient to be a uh, tensor and Y2 constant because of its respect to W6. This is constant. So we, we make a small change based on uh, uh, those values. Of course, this uh, change is uh, very small because of the learning rate is very small. But uh, we do the same for W5, W1, W2, W3, W4. And we do the same process for each training data point. We have thousands of them. And then each, each, uh, each time we go through all the data points, is called one epoch. And uh, most of the time we will repeat this process um, many epochs. So eventually we will have the optimized WMs in those uh, in those uh, connections and then uh, also biased. So we call the model is fully trained. Uh, but when you are training the model, uh, there is one problem you should pay attention, which is called the overfitting problem. So normally, if after we collect the data set, we will split it into training, 80%, validation 10%, and uh, testing 10%. Uh, what is overfitting is this. So when you are training, look at this graph here. Uh, we have many epochs, and we monitor the loss, both, both measured on the training data set and the validation subset of them. So when you are training, of course, the loss of training will go down gradually and all the way down to the optimum, right? But uh, the validation subset, subset is, uh, is not seen by the computer or by the model. In other words, the validation and the testing, they are very similar to training, but they are not the same. What to, the purpose of us working on those models is that we want to generalize our model so it works on unseen data. So if, for example, if I have the model here, I want to test, I want it, I want it to work well in the testing subset. But uh, here, if we look at the loss for validation, uh, when we keep on training many epochs, at a certain point, uh, it will go down first, and at a certain point, the validation loss will go up. The reason is that the model will specialize like overly specialized in the training set because it was optimized on the same data. It will work very well on training, but not so well on validation. So we use a technique called early stopping to find the lowest validation loss, which is the most generalizable model. And we save the model at this point. At this point, this technique is called early stopping to avoid overfitting. So uh, uh, with this in mind, and uh, I want to also talk about a, a little about uh, the output format and the input. So here we have, again, we have the uh, uh, neural network structure. This structure is fixed, meaning that uh, when it's training, we don't change uh, the elements in the input and the output. 
So when you build your data set and build your new network, you should uh, also consider how the output format is. Is it probability? Is it classification? For example, if it's classification, here we have six different classes. If it's class four, we give uh, the fourth element one, the rest zero. And also the input format is important as well. It can be numbers, it can be audio, it can be images. Okay, now we are moving on to a convolutional neural network. This, so the training process under the uh, structure, uh, under the uh, overfitting technique, uh, the early starting te technique is the same as neural network. But here, convolutional neural network statement is designed specifically for pictures. So this is the overall uh, structure of the cinema. This structure is also called, sometimes called architecture of the same name. We have the input RGB images, and we have different layers to process it. And in the output, we have numbers representing, uh, for example, classification. And uh, in between, in those layers, we have kernel. For example, this kernel is a three by three matrix with weights inside. And uh, then we apply this kernel by using, uh, by sliding over the image. So this is red, green, and the blue channel. And we have uh, many kernels, more than three, to slide over. And then we process the image so we have a smaller, slightly smaller result and we pass it down and down. And uh, here I'm gonna go through one convolutional computation so you get a better idea. Uh, remember the kernels, they have weights that we want to optimize so we can extract the good information from the picture for our purpose. And here we, we let's say this kernel is uh, a three by three matrix like this. And when the kernel is at position one, we do multiplication on the element level and then, then we sum it up. So we apply those elements nine on those nine cell and sum it up, we have 21. And when the position, when the kernel is at position two, we do the same calculation and we have 19. But I, and then we do the same by sliding this kernel all over the image. And we have a slightly smaller uh, output. The idea is, uh, of com convolutional computation is here. So if you look at the original image, we have an edge, a diagonal edge here. On the upper left, it's all sevens. On the bottom right, it's all fives. After this uh, convolutional computation, we still have the edge, 17 here. But uh, somehow on the bottom right, it is slightly different from the edge line itself. It's 15 versus 17. The idea is that uh, this kernel can extract the edge. And uh, when we are training the model, uh, this kernel, uh, the, the weights in this kernel can be negative, can be positive, can be decimals, can be a very uh, a different combinations. So that uh, this uh, convolutional computation can extract uh, color, feature, shapes, a lot of uh, different information. Okay, so then, uh, here I will go through the basic computer vision tasks. Uh, there are a there is a line of traditional computer vision techniques such as uh, finding the uh, edges or changing the color you using your Photoshop software. And here we are talking about computer vision uh, tasks based on machine learning or CNN. So the first the task is uh, simple. It is called image classification. So given an image, and then you guess the probability of this image is a cat or not. So if it's not a cat, cat it's zero. If it is a cat, it's 100% or 95%. And then the second one is localization and the classification. So we can simply do a box and slide it over all the possible locations in this image we can find. So we can find the cat. And whenever there is multiple objects, cats, dogs, and ducks, 
we want to detect all of them, but with different classes with, with the correct classes. This is called object detection. And uh, uh, the last one is instant segmentation. So here we are we, we want to be more precise than bounding box. So we want each pixel to be classified as a as if it is a part of a dog or a part of the dog. So those are the basic uh, computer vision tasks uh, we, we will talk about. And for image classification, the first, very first one, uh, of course, there are prepared data sets and architectures that we can use. Otherwise, we, you have to build your own. That's a, that's a lot of work. The very, uh, in the early days, uh, there is a data set called MNIST database. It has 60,000 images. Those are all handwritten digit images. So for example, one, two, three, all the way to nine. And uh, there is ImageNet. This is more recent. Uh, this is a, a very uh, famous one and the people are still actively working on this. ImageNet, uh, this is an example of ImageNet. So it's organized so that all the flowers are one class, elephants, another class, dogs are different class. So altogether, ImageNet has 1.2 million images for a thousand classes. And also there is a single understanding. And uh, with those prepared data sets, uh, many uh, researchers developed a lot of different architectures. So uh, we have VGG 16 or 19 series. Uh, the number here means how many layers are used in this uh, architecture or seeing the structure. Uh, Google, the net, also there is ResNet, 50, 50 layers, 100, 100 layers. Uh, in the hands-on experiment we are going to do today, we use ResNet here. And this is a, a famous uh, object detection algorithm. It's called a you only look once YOLO architecture. And uh, we can we can see uh, the the part that is not the output is almost the same as classification. The trick is in the output. So in this output, we don't have the zero and the ones for uh, for probabilities for each class. Instead, we have x and the y and the width and height for the bounding box. And then we can have, for example, a uh, hundred bounding boxes. And for each bounding box, we do classification with the probability. And in this case, uh, in, in this case, we can do object detection. Of course, uh, this output will be huge. It will have a lot of numbers representing the coordinates of x and the y and the class probability. So object detection data sets and architectures. Uh, the the big ones are Coco, developed by Microsoft with the 300,000 images and eight classes. So this is the one example. So when Microsoft prepares this data set, they first collect images and then manually label, for example, lap, laptop, bottle, cups, etc., And uh, then uh, publish this and the people work on that. So you can also search eye detection on your app store. You can download an app and you can play with uh, this data set and the detection. There's another one called Open Image with nine million images. And uh, famous or well established uh, object detection architectures include YOLO series, RCMM, RetinaNet, and uh, etc. And then uh, the next. Uh, uh, the, the, the more precise uh, middle vision task is for the pixel segmentation. So on the left, so this is a, on the first half of the architecture, we see a single structure. We have input and we have different layers same one, and then we have a lot of parameters in between. But on the output, we have kind of a reverse uh, structure as the first half. So we want to reconstruct an output that has the same dimension as the input. 
And in the output here, we have a lot of pixels. And each pixel is assigned to a class, for example, a duck or a dog. And if it, it, does, it does not belong to anything, it's the background, it's the zero. So this is the pixel segmentation. Pixel segmentation data sets and architectures are uh, in this table. And uh, ADE 2000K, uh, 20, 20K has 150 different classes, including cars, road, sky, and uh, vegetation. Uh, and when, when you prepare the data set, you have to manually label each pixel and draw the boundary and whatever is inside it, for example, this is the building. Whatever inside this boundary is the car, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Self-driving cars use this uh, segmentation technique a lot because we want to tell the road as well as the lanes. And also uh, Coco and Open Image we previously mentioned, they are expanding their uh, data sets to uh, segmentation as well. So sometimes they inter, uh, inter, intersect with each other. Famous pixel segmentation architectures include UNET, SegNet, and the PSV net. Of course, there are more, as well as the data sets. So those are the uh, fundamental or the basic computer vision techniques. And then now I'm going to move on to more advanced computer vision tasks. I will not go into details. I will just briefly introduce how they are used. So the first type is called a generative adversarial network. This has a lot uh, many pixel segmentation networks combined together. So it can generate uh, fake images. So all those people here are not real. And uh, somehow we can create fake images that look like real. The second type is, uh, is video understanding. So uh, I introduced that we can do classification, we can do object detection. And if we can track the, each person in this video, we can tell if this person is standing or carrying something or speaking, et cetera. This is very useful for a lot of applications. But this is the state of the artwork. So it's not a well established. Maybe one of you can solve the problem. And uh, human key point detection. So on the left, we can see uh, the human skeletons are reconstructed automatically. And uh, how we do that is we build a data set with, uh, with 17 or 16 key points on human body, including the head, shoulders, hips, knees, and the feet. And then we train an algorithm that can generalize this model to all the videos. And this is very useful for uh, filmmaking, uh, animation making. And on the right side, it, it is also key points. But uh, in this case, the key points will be the edges of your eyes, uh, your mouth, the shape of your face, et cetera. This is, uh, for example, the TikTok filters. Uh, you can make yourself a dragon. And the, this is the, uh, this is the algorithm behind it. Okay, we introduced a lot of computer visions. Today we are only going to do a classification in PyTorch. So why uh, I chose PyTorch is uh, it's in this table. I will talk about them briefly and uh, tell you why uh, we chose PyTorch. So uh, PyTorch's rivalry is TensorFlow, developed by Google. TensorFlow is very good. It's very detailed and has a lot of detailed functions. And it's compatible with the C++ uh, and uh, JavaScript. So if you are working on a website, probably this is the way to go. Uh, but it's very complicated, TensorFlow. And uh, Dino is kind of uh, fading away. Uh, Keras is now combined with TensorFlow 2.0. So Keras is very user friendly. It has a lot of predefined architectures and functions. For example, uh, different loss functions pre, uh, pre written. And uh, if you are new to, uh, very new to 
machine learning, you can try Keras. Cafe here, developed by Berkeley Vision and Learning Center, is in C++. And uh, this one is very fast, and it has most of the computer vision uh, architectures. But uh, the shortcoming is that the Cafe does not work with Python, and uh, it does not work with the tasks besides computer vision, for example, audio or recurrent uh, neural network, time-based neural network. So uh, we use PyTorch, developed by Facebook. Uh, PyTorch is nice because it has a lot of pre-built architecture and pre-trained weights. These pre-trained weights uh, are trained on the famous data sets I mentioned earlier, like the Coco, ImageNet. So you can just download them and just use it. And uh, PyTorch has a very nice GPU management package. So, you know, we calculate a lot of uh, partial derivatives, like I mentioned in new networks. Uh, GPUs were developed for gaming, but the GPUs have a lot of small processes and memory. So it can do the gradient or do the partial derivatives very fast. And also uh, a media AI platform called CUDA, this is very, uh, well optimized for this kind of training process. So uh, if you want to seriously do some uh, uh, training, you need an NVIDIA a GPU card. And uh, PyTorch does the GPU management automatically. Okay, then uh, the exercise for today. So I prepared uh, some code in Google Colab. Today we are going to make a dog breed image classifier. Uh, we have seven dog breeds here. Uh, we will put this in a list. We have Beagles, Golden Retriever, Mini Australian Shepherd, Border Collie, Corgis, and uh, Labrador Retriever, and the French dog. So the code I made is self-contained, which means that you can change this list to your interest. It can be a car brand, it can be a celebrities or food or uh, different buildings, etc. So uh, I will copy and paste the link here and share it in the chat box. And you can go ahead and paste this link in your browser. So you should see something like this. And I do have, so this is a webinar, a virtual webinar. So I can, when you, when you look at my screen, you can see your own. So what I will have you do is that uh, you can run the first sale and then run anyway, click on this. And you go ahead and do it. And uh, uh, on your uh, on your Zoom, there is a reaction button, and uh, whenever I ask you if you are good, you give me a thumbs up. Uh, when I ask you if you have run this sale, so I know what's going on. Let me say it again. So we run the sales individually by ourselves, and then we come back, and I will go through each line, and then. Uh, if we see the same results, I will ask you and you will give me a thumbs up. Okay, thank you. So do you have the Google Colab open? Are you in? Do you have the same uh, results as me? Okay, I see three. Okay, thank you. So uh, then we can go ahead and run the first sale and also run all the sales in install necessary 
module to download the data. We run each cell like that. And the, just the leave it running. Okay, I had some uh, difficulties. So run all the cells and in install necessary module to download the data. And I will come back and uh, walk through what's going on in this code, all the way to load and split image data here. So if you are, uh, if you can see complete image and some file name, uh, give me a thumbs up. Okay. So if you have uh, difficulties, let me know. You should see a uh, complete image, 77, et cetera, et cetera, JPG. And it should, should go on for a while. Okay. So what is going on is that uh, in the first sale, we import Torch and we also import Torch Vision and uh, as well as other dependent uh, libraries that we are going to use. And uh, Torch Vision itself has a lot of uh, predefined data set and models uh, that we are going to use. The rest is just, uh, for example, PLT to visualize uh, Seaborn and the Panda to do the data processing. And here in the PIP install, Google image download. This is a uh, outside library that we uh, that, that we are going to use to download images uh, from Google by searching the keyword. Okay. After we install this, we create a folder for the download and we create a model name for the dog breed classifier. And uh, if you click on files here, this is your files your files uh, on Google Colab, so you can see downloads. And if you click on download, you can see uh, the code here is downloading all the dog breed images for you. So here we put the list of dog breeds here as a search query. Uh, this is not in, uh, very important because each time you download your data is gonna be different. But uh, uh, this is where you should change it if you want, uh, for example, core brand. And we can check what do we have here. So if we click on Beagles, double click, we have the Beagle image here. This is very big. So for example, this one. And uh, you should check all most of the folders to make sure uh, what you have is what you want, French Bulldog. Okay, so uh, by, run, by running this uh, cell, we are downloading and organizing 
uh, the training data. And uh, if now we go down, we should see uh, this is a completed. All the way to the last one is the French Buddha. And if you have that, you know, we now we should go ahead and run all the sales in load and split image data. Run every cell. And I will come back and uh, explain what's going on. So after you run that, you should see the data set size. We should have a test with uh, 68 images, training 500 or so, and validation 68. Your number should be similar to this, depending on uh, Google's availability. Sometimes you cannot download some images, but most of them should be okay. So if you have this number printed out, can you give me a thumbs up? Good. If you are stuck, you can just a screenshot or post in the chat box. I can see what's going on. Okay. Seems like uh, everybody got it. So here we are loading and splitting the image data. As I previously mentioned, we already downloaded and organized all the dog images. And here we have the transform function. Uh, I want to mention that we have to resize all the images to a fixed uh, size. This, because this model works for all the images. So we are here resizing the images to two, 24 by 224. And uh, we build this function for each image. And we have the dataset image loader, which is from PyTorch. It will load all the images automatically. And here we are splitting the training, validation, and the testing portions. Like I mentioned, it's 80% and 1% and 1%. And eventually we will have training set, validation set, and the test set. And uh, here, this is uh, uh, on the, in, the, in, in the last line here. This is a device, torch.device. So it will automatically detect if you are using GPU or CPU. I think in Google Collab, you are using CPU. And then we have the data size loaded for testing, training, and uh, validation. And then here, I am show here this function. This is just to visualize what you have. You should see uh, the dogs, the random dogs picked out. You should see them uh, be printed out here. If you can see this, give me a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, thank you. So next we run all the sales in build model section. Okay, this one, the second one, let me go down. And also we run all the sales in training model section. This one, this one, this one. Uh, all the way to visualize model and the torch save here. Okay, if you can, if you can find the print model underscore FT, if you can find this and see ResNet here, give me a thumbs up. That means uh, your code is running properly. Okay. 
and you should see an uh, epoch zero forward slash four, like this. Okay, good. So it uh, seems like uh, your code is running. And uh, so what we are doing here is that we are training the model. How we do that is here, train model. So first we need a model from PyTorch predefined. So we use model start ResNet 18. And we put the flag for pre-train true. So we are downloading, we are downloading from uh, downloading the weights from PyTorch server. Uh, so we have the model structure and the weights already. But uh, this ResNet is pre-trained on Coco dataset, which has 80 different classes. So we want to make a slight modification here. Model FT, which is what we got from PyTorch, start fully connected layer. This is the last one. And we give it the length of class names. The length of class name is the list for the dot breed. So the length of the class name is seven because we have seven different breeds. And we fit this model to whatever device we find. It can be CPU, it can be GPU. GPU and uh, we define the criteria. Criteria here is the same as the error matrix, uh, error metric or the uh, loss function. Here we are using NN, which is uh, from PyTorch. Uh, we use the predefined loss function called cross entropy loss. So this is our loss function. And we have optimizer, which is a function that we use for the model training and the model uh, back propagation. So here, this optimizer is from, again, PyTorch optim dot sgd. And we fit the learning rate here. SGD here means stochastic gradient descent. This is one type of uh, backpropagation technique. And the uh, gradient descent is, it means that we look at the partial derivatives and then we change the weight. Stochastic here means means that we have so many pictures, we don't go through all the images at once. We take, for example, 20% of the image. And in the next epoch, we take a look at the other 20%. And in the next epoch, we take a look at the, the other 20%, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how you define loss function, optimizer, and also we have the learning rate scheduler which we reduce 0.5 every seven epochs. Uh, in our experiment, we are not gonna do that because of uh, the time, but uh, you can change that uh, to what you want. And then, so altogether, we print out the model structure. You can see this is ResNet. And we have the conv1, convolutional layer number one, and this is a 2D convolutional. And we have the kernel size, which is seven by seven, and uh, the parameters for that. And also here, this ReLU is the activation part. You can see this resonator is also intricate, and it has many blocks. But if you go down, at the end, you should see out features is equal to seven. This is what we want because uh, uh, we have seven different uh, dog breeds that we want to train. So this is uh, the modification we made. And here the model is training. We have the model FT downloaded from PyTorch, loss function, optimizer, learning rate, and we set the epoch equal to five. Because we don't, uh, we don't have that much time to train a lot. And here we see the output epoch Epoch from, epochs start from zero. So this is epoch zero. We have the training loss measured using the criteria here. And we have the accuracy, this is 62%.
And we also we have the validation loss. And we have the validation accuracy, 86%. So loss here, it depends on how you define your loss function. It does not have a unit. It just tells you in each epoch if the model is doing better or worse. The accuracy percentage here is how many images are correctly classified. So here we have one, two, three epochs. We have five to go. And we can see the accuracy of the training is increasing. But uh, for the validation, it's not always increasing. Sometimes it decreases. So you can keep an eye on that. And after that, we will visualize the model and do some samples. So what is happening in this training model? And how we save the model is here. If we go back up in the build the model section, we define the train model function. We pass down the model and the loss function, etc. define the epochs. And then we build an empty best model here, it's empty. And for each epoch, we have two phases, training and validation. And when you are training, you calculate the loss here, and you use loss backwards and the optimizer to do the back propagation. Also, it's called the training. And after each epoch, we measure the epoch loss and epoch accuracy. Okay, and the, then we look at the validation phase. So for each epoch, we measure the accuracy on the validation data set. And we record the best accuracy if we have a better accuracy in this current epoch. And whenever the, the current epoch has worse accuracy than the best one, we save the best model. The previously saved the best model, we copy that in the memory. And after all the epochs are finished, we save the best uh, epoch model, which is corresponding to the best epoch accuracy on validation um, subset. This is how we do early stuff. And there are different ways. Of course, you can wait a little bit if you have a lot, hundreds of epochs. Uh, Etc. It's up to you how you save it, but you need to do early starting to make a generalizable uh, uh, model. And the next, uh, this is the visualized model. This is in the build model section. Uh, visualized model is not important. We are just uh, loading the model and uh, visualize. Uh, we are picking 16 random images from the testing subset. And then we visualize that. So if we go down, we should see uh, we have epoch number three. So we still have to wait a little bit for epoch number four to finish. So if you have difficulties running the code, if you are not seeing epoch zero, one, two, three, uh, you can ask me now. If you are seeing uh, the same output accuracy, you give me a thumbs up. No, the numbers don't have to be the same as mine. As long as you can see epoch and the loss and the validation loss, that is fine.
Yes, uh, everyone should be on epoch number four, three or four, and it should finish soon. So normally it uh, will take two minutes for one epoch. Okay, if after the visualized model sale, you can see uh, both like this, it's in a grid, uh, you are good. That means your model is fully trained and uh, it's making predictions. How we, how, how we understand this is that uh, for each randomly selected image, the model will make the prediction. For example, Labrador Retriever, and for this image, we, we downloaded this, so we know it is Labrador Retriever. And the model predicts those are the same breed with a confidence of 99. We have 16 samples, so we can go over them to see if the model is doing good. So here in the prediction, we have the breed name and the ground truth has the, the folders name that we previously downloaded. So this is the golden retriever puppy, and uh, it's predicted as Labrador retriever. This is uh, a wrong prediction. This is also called a false positive. And the confidence is uh, 0.68. So this is where the model did wrong. But the rest, broad collie, corgi, corgi, broad collie, beagles, the rest, uh, French bulldog, the rest look uh, okay. And uh, for example, this one is not exactly well, but uh, it is still predicted uh, correctly. So what do you see on your screen now? Should, uh, be simil should it be in a similar format, 16 images, but the images will be different. And you will have some right, some wrong. Do you have that? If you have that output, uh, you can give me a thumbs up. Good. So if your cells are still running, you can just wait a little bit. It will show up. Okay, now we move on to the next cell. This is the output format section. We have three cells. We can. Uh, so in this cell, we have to pick an image. So my downloading image is different from yours because uh, because of each computer is different, and uh, you pick any picture from the download folder that is to your liking. We are going to do an experiment. You can select anyone, then copy path here, of course. And then replace this string with what you just copied. And then run all the sales. And you should see a different dog picture, but you should see some visualization like this. And you should see numbers underneath confidence and the search code. Okay, I can do it again. So here in this, uh, in this uh, cell, we are going to print out the output format. In order to do this, we need one example. And uh, the example 
will be from the already downloaded images, let's say uh, a beagle, and then we find any random picture. For example, this one, we copy the path here to the path. And then we have image open with a, a string inside of a uh, bracket. We paste, we paste the directory of this image and we run it. And you should see a dog. And it says this is a beagle or Australian shepherd, etc. Do you have that? If you have that, you can have that. Do you have that? Okay, if you have that, uh, that means uh, you selected a valid image and you have the output. So what is going on here is that we have image, image open this directory, and then we show that. And of course we resize to make uh, it uh, suitable for the model. And in output, we apply the model on the input X, which is the image. And in the output, we have confidence here. So if we print out confidence, confidences, it's a list of uh, numbers. Here we have seven numbers. One, two, three, and so on and so forth. And the number, those are all very small numbers except uh, the fifth number, which is 0.99, this one. Oh, sorry, uh, I have to run it. So we have seven numbers. Uh, the, the biggest number here is 0.99 at the first position. And our search query, uh, which is how we order the folders for each dog breed, is this, is Beagle's Golden Retriever and the French Bulldog. So the first number means the probability for Beagles. The second number means the probability for Golden Retriever. And so on and so forth. So if we visualize the probability of uh, this list, this is the output confidence. We can see uh, Beagles has the highest probability or confidence, whereas the rest don't have any. Uh, based on this, we can do a cutoff, uh, cutoff uh, threshold, say if it's greater than 80% or 0.8 probability, we say this is a beagle. You can go ahead and try many different dogs in your collection and some, sometimes it's wrong. And sometimes, for example, if it's a mix of corgi and a beagle, it will, have, it will give you 0.6 beagle, 0.3 corgi and etc. because you have mixed the dogs. Uh, and those are very interesting. Uh, you can go ahead and try. But here, the main point is that we, the output is, according to how we modify the model, is a list of seven numbers, confidence. And each number represents the probability of each class. That's how we understand the output of the model. And then now, we go down to the computation matrix result analysis. This is the last uh, section. Okay, we should run all the cell. This should be very fast. What we are doing here is that we had samples and we randomly picked a few images to see how the model works. But we need the numbers, percentage of how this model works for each class. So this is the testing results of all the testing images uh, predicted by the model. And here we visualize it in a confusion matrix. So here each row means the ground truth that we know uh, in terms of dog breed. And each column here is the prediction. And we have the accuracy of 92%. What I mean by that is for example, for corgis, all the corgis in the testing image, we have 14 corgis predicted as corgi, correct. But we do have one corgi that is predicted as beagle. 
So this is how you understand the confusion matrix. And uh, if you have a larger testing set, of course you can have a larger matrix. And then we put all those uh, results in percentage. Then we can see for COVID, 93% of COVID are predicted as COVID. The best, uh, the model works the best for many Australian shopping and the French Bulldog. They have 100% accuracy. And uh, the model works the worst for Golden Retriever, only 88%. But the overall testing accuracy is not good. So this is the last uh, result. If you can see this, uh, that means uh, you already have the model built and everything. If you want this code, you can do file, download, and download uh, as a Jupyter file or Pi file to your local computer. Also, you can find the, the GitHub uh, on its website. So you can uh, check this again on Google Colab. So this is a, a classification uh, exercise we're going to do today. And uh, this is the end of the presentation. Now, do you have any questions? Feel free to post it or uh, to type it in the chat. And then if you want to learn more about uh, techniques more than just the classification, you can email us as well. We can organize more tutorials and webinars. Thank you. Howdy, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So with depth, depth cameras, they can use like almost like point cloud data along with the image. You can extract like the points that correspond to different objects in the image. Could you do a process similar to this to extract those points that correlate to that part of the image? So the question is that can you classify uh, cloud points, right? Correct. Uh, so cl cloud points works like uh, like this. So you shoot lights and then you receive it back with the intensity and like colors of uh, of the of the objects, right? You will still have to manually label all of them and then train a model specifically for the point cloud. Uh, then what do we have? For example, Coco. Those are taken by cameras for point cloud you need the point cloud uh, shapes because they they're different and they're 3d not 2d okay so we would have to use something besides the cnn in order to train the point cloud data probably you want to look at the 3d cnn okay thank you thanks
Yeah, so if there is no further question, uh, we can end this webinar now. And uh, if you find more questions later, you can always email me. Okay, thank you, Yang. Thank you. Thank you.